All right, we're going to do a segue into our next presenter. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Leela from Nutriscience Innovations. Nutriscience is underwritten this, center, this session, and it's the Gabba Ergic Shunt Explain how dietary ingredients like L-theanine and adaptogens affect cognitive behavior and stress. Okay, Michael, are you with us? You come on screen and unmute yourself. I am. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thanks, and uh, let me just set up here. I am just getting myself set up. We have a minute or two to go. So that gives me an opportunity just to. If you go slideshow presentation, you should be good. Right. Um, I'm blocked by something up at the top, but I will get that set up in a second. There we go. You are good to go. So I, I think there's a, a minute or two more to go, or shall I just go you, dive you right in? You can dive right in, Michael. All right, I'll dive right in. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my session. I'm Michael Layla. I'm the Chief Science Officer at NutriScience Innovations. I'm going to be talking about the GABA shunt. What is GABA? What is the shunt? What, what are GABAergic modulators? What, what is GABAergic and what are uh, different kinds of um, ingredients that behave as modulators that affect GABA and ultimately then mental wellness? So let's dive right into what GABA is. GABA, uh, uh, gamma amino butyric acid, it's the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in our bodies, okay? Um, it's synthesized uh, from glutamate, and we'll talk a little bit about that. It's synthesized in the body. Your body can make GABA. And basically, what is, why is GABA important to us? Um, because we get, we, what happens is when we are stressed, we're going to get rapid and large increases in GABA production. Um, GABA can also uh, be st uh, stimulated by butyrate. And this, this is interesting, and this is a side issue because butyrate is an important signaling molecule in the gut. And so the, the gut-brain axis occurs through butyrate. Uh, butyrate has its own receptors in the uh, brain, but also uh, can stimulate GABA as well. And, and GABA is mostly found in the nervous system, but also it's found in the pancreas as well. So now that we have a basic understanding of, of GABA, the question that we have now is, you know, what, um, what does GABAergic mean? Have you heard this term before, GABAergic? Well, there's really two meanings to the word, uh, to the term GABAergic. There are the GABAergic neurons and these are neurons in your nervous system, which um, can produce GABA, and, and uh, they're called GABAergic neurons. And these have an inhibitory effect. This is how GAB, GABA interacts. And in basically two receptors, the GABA A receptor and the GABA B receptor, and they, they both have different mechanisms in which they operate. So that's the first meaning to the word GABA. The second me uh, to the word uh, GABAergic. The second meaning is that these are GABA receptor modulators. GABAergic modulators are dietary ingredients or drugs. They can be drugs which modulate GABA the GABA receptors, or they can also stimulate GABA production. So typically, that's how dietary ingredients have their effects on stress and mental wellness. And um, 
what is what is interesting is, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. GABA does not typically cross the blood-brain barrier, um, and but there are other mechanisms for getting GABA into the uh, blood into the brain. Now, the GABAergic shunt itself is basically the production of GABA from glutamate. Uh, using an enzyme to produce GABA. And then there is a, uh, it's converted into um, a, a, a other ingredients that, and then it circulates in the shunt fashion around and around in your body. And the upper portion here, you see the alpha ketoglutarate coming in and succinate coming out. This is part of the Krebs cycle, the Krebs cycle for energy. So GABA, there's a GABA shunt here and then the Krebs cycle, and they both interact with each other um, in, in terms of the production of GABA and its interaction with these various uh, mechanisms in the body. So coming back to GABA a little bit, just a further understanding of it. As I mentioned, it generally does not cross the blood brain, brain barrier. In fact, the, this is quite a controversial subject, uh, but, but it's believed there are other mechanisms for GABA to get to the brain. And then certain dietary ingredients, which we're going to talk about, cross the blood-brain barrier, and they combine to GABA receptors and modulate uh, GABA's activity. And then, of course, that then indirectly will, um, through this mechanism, will increase uh, relaxation, reduce stress, and improve mental well-being. So um, as a dietary supplement, GABA, is, as you know, is well used as a, dietary, as a dietary ingredient in dietary supplements, and it's known to produce a calming effect. But it's really unclear how this works, how much GABA actually crosses the blood-brain barrier directly. So it's not clear as to whether GABA as a dietary ingredient is really making a lot of difference. Um, there've been a um, number of studies that have contradictory results. Um, however, there are ingredients like L-theanine and the withanolide glycosides in ashwagandha that can, can cross the blood-brain barrier and increase GABA production and interact with the GABA receptors. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these types of dietary ingredients that can have an effect on mental wellness through the GABA shunt and the GABA pathways. So we're going to start off, but we're going to cover two of them as examples of dietary ingredients that have an effect on stress and anxiety reduction and mental well-being. The first one is L-theanine. L-theanine is an amino acid. It's found in green tea. And of course, that's how uh, L-theanine was discovered and found to be effective uh, in terms of, real, especially in terms of relaxation and then into stress and anxiety reduction and, and improvements in mental well-being. L-theanine, uh, can be produced by an enzymatic process that mimics that which is in the tea leaves itself, in the tea plant. And this particular form of L-theanine has been found to increase the state of relaxation, reduce stress and anxiety, and, and improve cognitive function. And we'll talk more about this. Um, so um, L-theanine, so here's some thoughts to leave you with. L-theanine is a GABA receptor modulated, which, so it'll cross the blood-brain barrier, interact with the receptor, and increase the production of GABA. In addition, separate from this, it also increases dopamine production and enhances alpha waves, and we'll talk about those things. And the neat thing about L-theanine as an amino acid is that its effects can be felt within 30 to 60 minutes. It's extremely fast, uh, it has an extremely fa fast effect, and you can feel the relaxation in a very, very short period of time. 
So the mechanisms for how L-theanine actually works um, have been sort of elucidated, um, not completely, but certainly there are some um, indicators of how L-theanine works uh, once it crosses the blood-brain barrier and into the brain um, and its effects on dopamine um, and its effects on GABA. I'm not gonna go through these in, in detail, but just to show you schematically that there's an understanding of this. Um, and here's an example of a, uh, sorry, here's an example of a publication in which um, the uh, L-theanine has been shown to affect the GABA-A receptors um, in an animal model. And in this way, we, we know that GABA has an effect uh, on um, the, um, the, the protective, neuroprotective effects. So let's take that now to a clinical study where we look at the effect of L-theanine on stress relief. And here's an example of a study showing a significant um, re a reduction in um, anger, anxiety, crying, irritability, uh, nervousness, other parameters like that in, a, in clinical studies. So the, the effects on L-theanine have been uh, uh, well established in terms of stress. In addition, there've been also studies on anxiety where we're measuring various anxiety parameters and looking at the effects. And again, L-theanine uh, suppresses anxiety and other uh, related um, behavioral effects. So this is a study um, on uh, L-theanine in terms of cognitive function. So L-theanine, in addition, will affect cognitive fu uh, function, for example, uh, mathematics, for exa uh, reaction time, uh, executive function. There are a number of different uh, working memory. There are a number of different aspects of cognitive function that uh, L-theanine has been studied for. And um, again, crosses the blood-brain barrier, interacts with the GABA receptors directly, interacts with dopamine, um, and in this way uh, affects uh, all these parameters which uh, improve mental wellness. So L-theanine has other effects as well, where um, the brain has uh, um, generates brain waves the alpha wave is related to relaxation and alertness, a combination of being calm, but yet alert. And L-theanine increases the frequency or the amount of the, the, the amplitude of um, alpha waves. And um, on the other hand, beta waves, which are uh, related to excitability, decrease. So in fact, there's a direct relationship here between L-theanine and brainwave activity as well. And you can see that in, um, in uh, these uh, brain scans, which show that we, uh, in consumption of L-theanine, you're gonna get um, uh, increased uh, alpha wave activity versus the control. And it's a dose-dependent effect as well. Increasing the dose of L-theanine increases the amount of alpha wave activity. So that gives you an idea about how an, uh, an er a GABAergic modulator such as L-theanine can affect GABA and the GABA shunt and also uh, increasing um, St decreasing stress, increasing relaxation and mental wellness. Okay, we're gonna cover now a second example, uh, which is, uh, related, which is an, uh, an adaptogen example. And we've chosen ashwagandha as the example of adaptogens. Uh, um, ashwagandha has seen a big increase in interest. And what is important here, and we're gonna focus in on the withanolides. The withanolides are um, the active compounds within uh, the plant. And what is unique about ashwagandha is that um, 
in the plant kingdom, there are only a very few plants that actually contain withanolides. There are some, and uh, ashwagandha uh, has by far the most amount of uh, withanolides as compared with any other uh, plant. You know, if you talk about flavanols and um, um, other uh, and other kinds of polyphenols. These are present in, in virtually all plants have flavanols. All plants have poly different kinds of polyphenols. Um, uh, maybe different kinds of them in different plants, but the withanolides are unusual in that ashwagandha uniquely contains withanolides and uniquely has high levels of these um, uh, withanolides. And there are at least 21 withanolides and their glycosides that are known to exist. And these are the ones that are responsible for the behavior. Uh, the stress relieving properties, for example, that are shown in this uh, clinical study of ashwagandha. But we're gonna focus on the, um, on the withanolides. So there are, with, there are two kinds of withanolides. There are the withanolide glycosides. And what this is, is a withanolide molecule that has a sugar molecule, the glycoside uh, uh, entity that is attached to withanolide. And the second form is the aglycone form of withanolides, which is just the withanolide itself without the sugar molecule. What's really interesting is that the withanolide glycosides are more bioavailable than the withanolide aglycones, or we'll just call them for short, withanolides themselves, um, because they are taken up in the, uh, in the gut um, and uh, then get uh, transported into the bloodstream, and then they end up uh, uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier into the brain. The, the withanolide glycosides uh, are found in both the roots and the leaves. And with new modern methods of extraction, we can get very high levels of withanolides um, and many different uh, varieties of the withanolide glycosides. And uh, I mentioned earlier that there are at least 21 withanolide glycosides that are known. And it's these uh, withanolide glycosides that have been found to modulate GABA and also histamine receptors. And we'll cover that a little bit. So since the withanolide glycosides are more available, they get, they get absorbed in and some of them get converted back into the withanolides or the aglycones in the body. And these withanolides are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and increase expression of, of the GABA receptors. In addition, um, some studies have shown that the withanolides also increase the levels of histamine and histamine neurons themselves also release more GABA. So there are multiple pathways here for um, GABA uh, release. Uh, and, and if you remember in the case of L-theanine, um, there were interactions that really were not only related to uh, GABA, but also to dopamine. In the case, and this is an example here, the withanolide glycosides where you have GABA and you have histamine uh, uh, expression as well. Now the withanolides uh, tend to act slower than L-theanine. L-theanine I had mentioned earlier acts within 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and the withanolides are, are, are more slower acting. Um, and so the idea with a uh, withanolide is to build up their levels in the body over time and continue to take um, the, the adaptogens over time so that you can get um, high levels of withanolides in your blood. So this, there have been some mechanistic studies, not as much as, uh, as with L-theanine, but with the, with the uh, with analyte glycosides, um, there have been studies, uh, animal studies, looking at uh, the modulation of GABA and the modulation of the histamine receptors. And in this particular study, 
um, we can see that um, increases in um, the activity of these receptors um, and also histamine release increases when you have um, a, a, a larger amounts of the withanolides uh, acting. So we know from mechanistic studies that uh, such effects exist. So um, in summary, um, let's go back and review what we've learned here. Um, GABA is the primary inhibitory neuro neurotransmitter in the uh, central nervous system. And it acts on GABA receptors. There are two kinds of GABA receptors um, and they each behave differently. Um, they're very specific in terms of, of how they, they behave. The GABAergic shunt itself is responsible for the endogenous production of GABA in the body. Endogenous means that it's occurring in the body. GABA is produced in the body by itself um, and, uh, and it typically is increased in response to stress and anxiety. On the other hand, um, exogenous GABAergic modulators, exogenous means from outside the body, these would be dietary ingredients that are consumed um, are, um, also have effects on uh, GABA receptors. And then um, oral, so, you know, maybe the, since we know that GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, um, the, obviously the way to go is to increase GABA content by taking it orally and many dietary supplements provide this, but the, 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 um, the evidence is, is not completely there and the jury is out about whether orally consumed GABA actually has a direct effect on, um, on, on the brain. So instead we've looked at here two dietary ingredients, very different kinds of dietary ingredients, L-theanine, which is an amino acid, and the withanolides that are present in ashwagandha. Both of these types of ingredients, L-theanine is a specific ingredient, um, while the withanolides are a family of um, compounds in ashwagandha that cross the, the blood-brain barrier and affect uh, GABA receptors. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, just to highlight the differences here, um, L-theanine acts really fast. You can act, feel the effect, a relaxation effect within 30 to 60 minutes on consuming L-theanine. It crosses the blood brain barrier. It goes from the gut, crosses the, the gut lining and into the blood and then up to the blood brain barrier extremely fast while with, the withanolides are, are slow acting and take time to, uh, to show their effects. And so consuming withanolides over time is important. Um, and both these two dietary ingredients as examples of uh, dietary ingredients that uh, are uh, uh, GABAergic modulators induce stress, uh, they, they, they activate the, the, the receptors, they activate the production of GABA, they induce relaxation, stress and anxiety, um, and, um, improve, and improvements in cognitive behavior, and, the, and there are clinical studies to show all of this. Um, and uh, these are really the, 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 the pieces that come together in terms of mental well-being. With that uh, overview, I thank you for your attention um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, a lot of science there, a lot of mechanistic science. Um, I think you've introduced a couple terms uh, for us. I know as we were sort of planning and plotting this session, um, I figured there'd be some, some novelty to it. Um, so, so let me start with GABA and the GABAergic pathway. And I do encourage additional questions to come in. So how are those conversations going? I was familiar with GABA coming into this, but I've been in the industry for a while, but the GABAergic pathway was absolute novelty to me. So, so um, how did you come across that? And what kind of conversations and with whom are you having conversations in the industry sort of about the GABAergic pathway? 
actually, I don't think that that's been really communicated out into the industry and, and definitely not to consumers. And part of the purpose of uh, me talking about it was to introduce this concept that's well known uh, in, in, in the biochemistry, in, in biochemistry and the, the GABAergic shunt is well known. Um, and ga uh, GABAergic, the, the um, endogenous GABAergic modulators that, uh, that are in the neurons are well known. But um, the, the, the connection between dietary ingredients and the GABAergic pathway um, really needs to be explored further and communicated. Uh, and, and this is the mechanism for all these effects that we talked about. Yeah, and that's a great tee up for what we're trying to do as a vehicle for sure. Um, one of the, so, so a question I've been asking in several of the presentations is what happens to these pathways, whether that's the adrenal implications or others as we age, is anything known about the efficiency of the GABAergic, um, environment as we age, or is that a really cool area of, of targeted research for targeted product development? I think that's a, that's a, a great area for targeted <laughs> product development, I am not aware of any information on how these pathways behave um, as we age. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the marketplace, a lot of information, science, mechanisms of action. How do you go about talking to the marketplace? What are uh, guidance or what are you hearing or giving as far as co-formulation? Obviously, from your presentation, there's obviously a co-formulation that sort of drops out. We've also been asked a little bit about, has it been explored with things like T a, a, a CBD um, or even cannabis? Or, I mean, obviously, you're crossing regulatory gray areas there, but what kind of formulation conversations are happening in the marketplace, whether it's formulation ingredients or whether that's formats? So one of the purposes to, to, to use um, L-theanine and the withanolite uh, glycosides as examples was to, sh to also highlight their differences. Um, their, their mechanisms of action are different. Um, we talked about one uh, having a, a dopamine effect and the other having a histamine effect. And uh, in addition, the time frames of them interacting are very different. Uh, one acts very quickly, the other acts more slowly. And so uh, this is truly an opportunity for formulators to, to combine these different um, GABAergic modulators together to create uh, unique formulas that come at the problem from different angles. And so I think that, um, I, I think that talking about this and, um, and bringing to light or communicating to consumers that there are many different mechanisms of how we can reduce stress and how we can uh, reduce anxiety and improve mental wellness. And a good formula will try to bring all of these pieces or as many of these pieces together as possible which will uh, provide um, unique benefits uh, rather than just a single ingredient itself. Yeah, we've had uh, that. That's a that, and that's a, a, I guess good, solid, consistent advice that sort of runs rampant in in, in our experiences. Um, one of the things that's that's come up a couple of times over the course of the last couple of days has been the fall off of activating this cycle. Um, so again, this may be an area for future research, but. Um, do we know sort of the the half life, uh, or or what is the the length of the effect in this particular pathway? So um, the the in the GABA uh, ergic uh, shunt itself, it's very fast working. Um, uh, um, uh, a, a, a stress or anxiety event will stimulate the production of GABA very quickly. Um, and as your, your stress level decreases, the, the uh, GABA decreases very rapidly. Um, and um, th those effects endogenously, that means again, in the body are very, very rapid. Now, when you introduce, when you're introducing uh, dietary ingredients into the picture, 
um, there, there, there are different levels as we talked about. Um, and one of the things that you want to do, if you want to maintain the level of relaxation and mental well-being, for example, um, you want to uh, increase the amount of uh, ingredients that will um, continue to stay in the bloodstream. So they, they've got to have um, a long life in the bloodstream so that you're able to take advantage of those ingredients um, over time because you don't know, for example, when you're going to be stressed or when you're going to have an anxiety attack um, or when you want to have cognitive, improve uh, your cognitive skills at a moment's notice. And uh, one of the things to do is have a continuous circulation of these ingredients in your body and to take a a supplement every day is one way to do that. Yeah, so you want this uh, this experiential, but then you also have to counter that with a compliance to get maximum benefits, which uh, which uh, sometimes the seasonable or regu regular users will not do. Um, anything you can say in addition, I was surprised to hear the connection to the histamine receptor. I'm not intuitive to me. Was Did that surprise you? Um, yeah, it's um, it's not it, it correct. It's not an intuitive thing. Um, the point I'll make here is that there there are, in in our body there isn't just one mechanism for something to happen. There are always multiple mechanisms, um, and that's the way our body works in terms of having um, a primary mechanism, perhaps, and some secondary mechanisms that can. Um, have an effect also um, in case there's a problem with the primary mechanism due to disease or some other factor that causes the primary mechanism not to function. And our, our body is, is set up so that we have these uh, uh, additional mechanisms which allow for similar kinds of responses to be occurring simultaneously. And so um, it's uh, in that sense, uh, therefore, it's not a new, it wouldn't be unexpected that you'd see something like this uh, occurring uh, as well. Uh, it is interesting that it's dopamine in one case and histamine in another case, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so a question, our ITC research, our consumer supplement research, and I presented some of it yesterday. Um, shows that there is value in many aspects of branded ingredients and consumers are looking for branded ingredients. Maybe talk about the value proposition of branded ingredients generally and some of the aspects of them. So there are a number of features and benefits of branded ingredients. Uh, first of all, they are typically well-qualified, well-controlled from a quality perspective, because no brand wants to have an ingredient that fails to meet its specifications um, and fails to perform, uh, it doesn't have the purity and, um, and potency that the brand is communicating out there. So that's the first thing about a branded ingredient um, that's helpful. Um, this, the, the, the other part about uh, branded ingredients is that um, the brand owner um, has the wherewithal to do the clinical studies on their brand to demonstrate the uh, potency, the effectiveness of that branded ingredient. And um, it's, uh, it, it, that contrasts significantly with generic ingredients where these studies have not been done on the generic ingredient itself. So I think that these two are very powerful positions for branded ingredients in the marketplace. And we are seeing a tendency towards, brand, towards uh, supplement brands, including and naming branded ingredients in their products and consumers and also there's, um, there's marketing directly to consumers about branded ingredients and consumers are becoming aware of, the brand, of these brands um, in their products. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Very, very wide ranging, good scope of presentation. Really enjoyed our dialogue. Thanks for the questions.